Yes, the relay on YouTube. Check it out. Lots of uh, stories about me on there. All the boxing facts and info that you want in a very entertaining, educational manner. The relay. Check it out on YouTube. Welcome to the motherfucking relay where we're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Eddie Hearn, impresario of Matchroom Boxing, held an Instagram live Q&A today where he talked about how they're in negotiations to make McCaskill versus Cameron, and both parties want that to be their next fight. Ebony Bridges is set to defend her IBF title in September. Shannon Courtney, former WBA champion, she's going to make her ring return in October. Asked to sign Mitchell, Jamie Mitchell, who took the WBA title away from Shannon Courtney, Eddie Hearn said Jamie Mitchell is a matchroom boxer. Well, let's start at the top. If both Chantel Cameron and Jessica McCaskill are currently in negotiations to square off in the fall months, that has to mean that Kaylee Reese is still unavailable for the undisputed super lightweight title fight. Unified super lightweight champion Kaylee Reese hasn't seen action since late last year. And if she doesn't return to action at all this year, the danger for Kaylee is the Alphabet organizations may so decide to strip her of those Alphabet titles. You know, they pick and choose when they want to do their job. Who they want to order to fight a mandatory, who they don't want to order to fight a mandatory, who they want to strip of an Alphabet title, who they don't want to strip of an Alphabet title. There's a genuine risk there for Kaylee that the Alphabet organizations might so decide to strip her of her two alphabet titles if she doesn't return to action this year. That's just something you want to think about. The alternative fight, Cameron versus McCaskill. I like that fight just as much as the Kaylee Reese fight, if not more than the Kaylee Reese fight. Because Jessica McCaskill's coming off a big win over Alma Ibarra because she's strong, she's experienced. She is the welterweight division's undisputed champion. If they're currently in negotiations, one is left to wonder where the contest will take place. Will it take place at 140 pounds for Chantel Cameron's belt? or will it take place somewhere in between 140 and 147 pounds for Jessica McCaskill's titles, Jessica's belts? Rick Ramos has been adamant that they want to fight for Chantel's belts, not Jessica's. They want it at 140, not anywhere in between 140 and 147. They don't want Jessica's belts to be on the line. It's a backup plan. If she loses to Chantel at 140, it won't affect her status at 147, as that division's undisputed champion. That's what I think that's all about. If she were to go down to 140 pounds and lose lose to Chantel Cameron, well, she'd still have the run of the place at 147. She'd still have some leverage in that situation. Let's see if those two teams can't reach a deal. In reference to Ebony Bridges, who has very recently been ordered to face her domestic rival. This would be her first defense of the IBF title since having won it from Maria Cecilia Roma. A little over a week ago, news broke that the IBF has issued out an order for Ebony Bridges to defend her title against their number one contender, her countrywoman, her domestic rival Shannon O'Connell. We've talked about that fight here on the channel. The stylistic clash, the stylistic matchup of the pressure fighter versus the pressure fighter as both Ebony Bridges and Shannon O'Connell, they're mid-range to inside pressure fighters. They just so happen to have the same sweet spot. One fighter is a lot more experienced than the other. That's Shannon though, Ebony's a few years younger. Not as war-torn, not as much wear and tear as Shannon O'Connell who has been stopped at least two times before in previous outings and previous previous bouts. Shannon O'Connell's been on a tear lately, beating unbeaten fighters, but the one thing you'll notice is none of those fighters she's beaten. None of those fighters are big punchers, and Ebony Bridges is a big puncher. Got a lot of people out there, they don't like Ebony for whatever reason, and they get settled into the idea that they're not going to give her credit for anything that she does, and certain aspects about her go unnoticed, that she is a bigger puncher than Taylor Robertson, she is a bigger puncher than Shernika Johnson and Bianca Elmir. She's a bigger puncher and a better boxer than Kylie Fulmer. There are a lot of people that have convinced themselves that Ebony Bridges is just a big-breasted gimmick, and they don't realize she's actually a pretty good boxer and a heavy-handed puncher. And the relevance of that to this conversation is it makes it that much more probable that this fight ends in a knockout. It could be Ebony Bridges knocking out Shannon O'Connell. It could be Shannon O'Connell knocking out Ebony Bridges because they're both heavy-handed punchers, and they're both pressure fighters. A very interesting situation that looks to be going down in September. That is, unless Team Bridges pay Shannon O'Connell to step aside, though I don't know why they do that. Not unless they pin down a unification match. 
That's the only way they can get Shannon to step aside at this point. Not unless Ebony's gonna fight either Jamie Mitchell, Yuli Hang Luna, or Dina Thorsland in September. One of them in her very next fight. That's the only way it happens. If, if she's not unifying, she has to fight Shannon or the title is forfeit. Comes to the other Shannon, Shannon Courtney. She's supposed to be returning to action in October. The following month after Ebony Bridges' first title defense. If she comes back in October, it will have been roughly a year's time since Shannon Courtney's last fight since she lost the WBA title to Jamie Mitchell and underwent surgery. Eddie Hearn said that Jamie Mitchell is a matchroom fighter. I can only assume that that means they have Jamie Mitchell under contract. It's not unusual for a promotional outfit to have options on a fighter if they end up beating one of their own fighters. That's how some fight deals are structured. And that might explain why Matchroom saw it fit to get Jamie Mitchell out there, have a voluntary title defense against Carly Thumper Skelly. And we saw what happened. We saw that Jamie Mitchell beat Carly Skelly from pillar to post. What's she going to do in the mean in between time is the question, because the plan was supposed to be for Shannon Courtney to come back in a six rounder or an eight rounder leading up to the rematch with Jamie Mitchell. Which, based on this schedule, could end up taking place next year. I just told you guys in my post-fight recap that Shannon Courtney was seen wearing a rather sizable leg brace in that Jamie Mitchell fight. Post-fight, it turns out she needed surgery. She was fighting injured. And that I would like her chances in a rematch on two good legs instead of just one, as movement has been one of Shannon Courtney's finer qualities, but her movement was hampered in that fight. I'm just being honest. So now she's coming off a surgery and she has ring rust to shake off. So before we even know how she looks against Jamie for a second time. Before we even get to that, we need to see how she looks in October when she's set to return against an opponent that has yet to be announced. You know, I know a lot of people don't like Shannon Courtney. I know she's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's her boxing we're evaluating. It's her boxing we're talking about who she is as a boxer. These are some very interesting updates and let's see if Matchroom can bring this schedule involving all these fights and these fighters into fruition. Like I said, I want to fight Keith Thurman again. I think that'll be big. And um, even Lara, because he has a WBA middleweight belt, he said he'll fight me at a catch weight. So I, I, those fights interest me. That was Danny Garcia this past weekend post-fight after his decision win over Jose Benavidez expressing an interest in having a second fight with Keith Thurman, former champion Keith Thurman, who yeah. still campaigns as a welterweight where Danny has moved up to junior middleweight. He also expressed an interest in facing Erslandi Lara at a catchweight. Lara's up there at middleweight. He's got a WBA baby belt, a secondary title that lines him up for a shot at the full title. We also know that... Former WBC junior middleweight champion Tony Harrison was in attendance for Garcia versus Benavidez, likely scouting... Scouting the winner, which turned out to be Danny Gersha. You know, Danny looked good against Jose Benavidez, but Jose Benavidez does not represent the best and brightest fighter, best and brightest fighters in today's junior middleweight division. Jose, like Danny, is a guy who moved up from welterweight up to super welterweight. He's a rather immobile, albeit statuesque... I told you from the very beginning. From the moment Danny Garcia announced that he would be moving up from welterweight up to super welterweight. I told you, what this guy's likely going to do is face welterweights at super welterweight. He's going to fight 147 pounders at 154 pounds. That's what he's going to do. That's what he did this past weekend, and that's what he might end up doing with Keith Thurman. Fighting Arislandi Lara at a catchweight. Even today's aging Arislandi Lara is still a risky proposition for a guy like Danny, who will have a natural size advantage, a stylistic advantage. I'd wager he punches harder than Danny. And can take more abuse, too. I've never been a fan of Arislandi Lara's methodology. I've never been a fan of Arislandi Lara's boxing, but I'd be lying to you if I told you that he's not a skilled operator. He is a skilled operator, and it takes a lot to really hurt this guy. It takes a lot to beat this guy. Constant pressure like what we saw from Brian Castaño and Jarrett Hurd. And Danny Garcia, he's not a come-forward pressure guy. He's not a volume puncher either. If you want to make a pure boxer like Arislandi Lara uncomfortable, you have to throw punches in bunches. But one Danny Garcia this past weekend's fight wasn't being an aggressive come-forward volume puncher. Quite the opposite. It was his boxing, sticking and moving. Facing an immobile target that wasn't doing a hell of a lot out there. So, yeah, Danny was busier than that guy, but it's because that guy wasn't, wasn't doing anything. Overall, Danny isn't the busiest puncher per se. He's a boxer puncher who also has an affinity for counter punching. And boxer punchers, 
They are at a stylistic disadvantage against pure boxers. A pure boxer like Arislandi Lara, who would have the edge and experience at this weight, as well as the edge in size. He's some years older than Danny Garcia, but... But it's still a risky fight. Lara isn't as mobile as he used to be. The old saying goes, power is the last thing to go, but a fighter's legs, they're the first. And that might explain why Arislandi Lara doesn't spend quite as much time on his bike as he used to. Still a very risky fight for Danny Garcia, his maiden voyage, his junior middleweight campaign. I don't think he goes in that direction. What about Tony Harrison? Former champion Tony Harrison was in attendance for the fight, but it's the same underlying principle with Tony. Tony, like Arislandi Lara, is a stick and move outside jabber, a pure boxer with a height advantage and a reach advantage, an experience advantage at this weight against the noticeably smaller Danny Garcia. That's a lot of risks for not a lot of rewards. I don't think he goes in that direction either. I think he'd prefer to fight Keith Thurman for a second time, just a junior middleweight. The former unified welterweight champion Keith Thurman caught wind of Danny's expressed interest in facing him for a second time and put together a rather cringeworthy nursery rhyme saying, I'm too pretty, I'm too blessed. DSG can never pass the Keith Thurman test. I beat that boy with bone spurs. I wasn't even at my best. Man, my IQ is even higher. His feet are slow like a flat tire. This is not a game. It's not Street Fighter, but I will hit you with that yoga fire. Yoga flame. Yoga. Yoga fire. That's very nice. Very nice indeed. Keith Thurman currently sits atop the WBC's welterweight rank standings as their number one contender. In that way, he's basically in line for an Errol Spence Jr. fight Fight, should things between Errol and Terence not work out. The ongoing negotiations between the two remaining champions at 147 pounds, a lot of people feel that Keith Thurman is a shoe in a contingency plan of sorts, a plan B, that if things don't work out with Terence Crawford, they'll throw Errol in there with Keith. But what if things do work out between Errol and Terrence? Where does that leave Keith? That might leave Keith Thurman feeling a bit more receptive to moving up in weight and taking on Danny Gersha at 154 pounds because what the hell else is Keith doing? I hardly think he's about to take on guys like Jaron Boots Ennis. Hey, Montes Stanionis. Facing Danny Garcia for a second time, Danny Garcia, who he already beat well over four or five years ago, might seem a more attractive proposition to the former champion Keith Thurman than taking on one of these unbeaten up and comers who don't have the profile that Danny has. He might stand to make more money taking on Danny for a second time than facing one of them and risking yet another professional loss. Both Keith Thurman and Danny Garcia ended their long stints of inactivity this year. Danny Garcia was out for a little over a year's time, having dropped a decision to Errol Spence Jr. in late 2020. He didn't box all of last year, and he's only now returning to action seven months into this year. Keith Thurman, he was out even longer. He was out since 2019 after he dropped a decision and lost his world title to Manny Pacquiao. He sat out for a little over two years and very recently returned to action against Mario Barrios, who was coming off that knockout loss to Gervonta Davis at 140 pounds. Keith fought him at 147, but he didn't stop that guy. He decisioned him. Compared to who Keith Thurman fought, Danny was a little bit more ambitious for his return fight, his rebound fight. Compared to facing Mario Barrios, uh, junior welterweight who is moving up to welterweight after having been stopped at junior welterweight, Jose Benavidez was a more interesting opponent choice at a more interesting weight. Junior middleweight. Danny was a little bit more ambitious than Keith for his return fight. He seeks to avenge the loss he suffered to Keith, his first professional loss, recorded loss, in a rematch, though it's a rematch that no one is really asking for. And given the PBC's business practices, it's likely a rematch that they'd try to stick on pay-per-view. A lot of people had high expectations for their initial meeting, their initial fight, and the fight's aesthetic wasn't really entertaining. Didn't leave an impression, and afterwards, most people felt that both boys played it safe. Nobody was asking for a rematch then. They're not asking for one now. But I view this fight as a likelier fight for Danny's next fight than a Arislandi Lara fight or a Tony Harrison fight. Keith Thurman compared to those two guys, those two former champions, he's got more of a name and more of a profile, so I think that Danny would rather fight Keith 
than face any one of them. I think that both Arislandi Lara and Tony Harrison are receptive to a Danny Garcia fight, but how receptive is he to facing them? And finally, in men's super middleweight news, a bit of unexpected information per tweet from Michael Benson. Eddie Hearn has revealed that they are now in early negotiations to potentially make Jaime Munguia versus John Ryder next. Jaime Munguia is coming off that knockout win over Jimmy Kelly. After having rejected an offer from Showtime to cross over to their side of things and fight for a title against Jamal Trullo, he ended up fighting Ireland's own Jimmy Kelly. And Jimmy was doing pretty good up until he got stopped, up until he got knocked out. It seems that Jaime is having an extended stay in the super middleweight division. Because last I checked, John Ryder, he's a super middleweight. That's where he fought Danny Jacobs. And he's coming off that high-profile victory, that high-profile win. Both John Ryder and Jaime Munguia are mid-range to inside pressure fighters. So as far as the aesthetic of the match, if they actually get it over the line, it promises to be an all-action shootout. Does this mean Jaime Munguia is officially done at middleweight? Having accomplished very little there, it was a rather ignominious campaign as a 160-pound fighter. He's set to have what looks to be another fight as a super middleweight. The Demetrius Ballard fight, the Gabriel Rosado fight, those were middleweight contests. But Jaime's last fight, the Jimmy Kelly fight, that was fought above middleweight. And I've no doubts this John Ryder fight, this John Ryder fight will be fought above middleweight as well. This is likely going to be a super middleweight contest. Uh, likely going to be a Golden Boy promotion show too because Jaime Munguia is indispensable. If we had to compare which fighter is more indispensable to which promotional outfit, Golden Boy, they ain't got that many bodies to spare as it is and I don't think they're going to let Jaime be part of a matchroom show. If I had to guess, matchroom is willing to send John Ryder to the Golden Boy promotion side of things to take on Jaime Munguia in a mildly high profile fight. I mean, listen, they didn't want to let Jaime go over there to Showtime to box Jermall Charlo. We know that Oscar De La Hoya and Eddie Hearn, they're not exactly bosom buddies, even though both Golden Boy Promotions and Matchroom do business on the DAZN platform all the same. Those two guys ain't got the best relationship. Oscar's still raw that Canelo Alvarez chose to do business with Matchroom after parting ways with Golden Boy. He took it so fucking personal, I don't know why. Since parting ways with Golden Boy Promotions, Canelo jumped into bed with Matchroom room he did but he had a brief stint over there at the pbc as well oscar de la hoya seems genuinely bothered that canelo alvarez is doing business with eddie right now it just is what it is and if they get this fight over the line if i had to guess i'd guess it would be a golden boy promotion show as opposed to a matchroom show because i reiterate jaime munguia is more indispensable to golden boy than, than john is john Ryder is to matchroom this fight isn't set in stone though it's not made official they're in the preliminary stages of negotiation this time tomorrow, we could be hearing about Jaime Munguia switching gears, switching his focus, and fighting someone else. We know that Billy Joe Saunders, he's on the comeback trail after having suffered his first professional defeat at the hands of Canelo Alvarez last year. I thought I heard something about a Billy Joe Saunders versus John Ryder rematch. That was over a week ago. And this is what we're hearing this week. In truth, I don't mind this fight because it promises to be an all-action fight. The aesthetic of the fight promises to be entertaining because both Jaime Munguia and and John Ryder are mid-range to inside aggressive pressure guys, swarmers. This is a step up from a Demetrius Ballard, a step up from a Jimmy Kelly. A lot of people feel that John Ryder unofficially beat Callum Smith, and he should have been given the decision. We know that in his last fight, he won a decision over Daniel Jacobs. He's a veteran, been around the block, fought a lot of good fighters, and uh, he's a tough customer. And he could stand to be a little bit more busy. You know, in 2020, he only fought once. He only fought once last year in 2021. He's fought once this year. Daniel Jacobs fight I just mentioned. Let's see if they don't get this one over the line.